Isa, they have two children. Please join me in welcoming our Spring Fest 2015 MC. Thank you, Chair Coldfoot, for that introduction. I'm very pleased to be here uh, with many uh, Democrats in this room, more Democrats than I usually see on a daily basis. <laughs> um, I'm also pleased to be here uh, with many of my colleagues from the Oregon Legislature, both in the House and the Senate, and with a number of statewide officials also here that will be introduced and have been introduced, and of course, Congresswoman Bonamici. Um, I have the honor today of introducing Congressman Bonamici. Um, I remember her as a colleague uh, in the Senate, and I do have a few prepared words, but I'm going to try to stay on script, but most people that know me know I do not stay on script. Um, Suzanne, who I will refer to Suzanne for a moment, um, has an interesting background. And I think actually her background actually was part of why Congressman Bonamici is as good at her work as she is. Um, she um, worked her way through Lane Community College, the University of Oregon, and the University of Oregon Law School. And for those of you who know Senator Courtney, the President of the Senate, I would have to say at this point, she is a duck. Don't hold that against her. She is a duck. When I say she worked her way through, she worked in legal aid for those years. And when she completed her law degree, she went on to work for the Federal Trade Commission in consumer protection areas. And I think because of that, and because of her own feelings about these issues, she feels very strongly that for a society to be just, it has to be just for all. And justice shouldn't be determined by the size of your pocketbook. Um, it should be at the core of, of our values. Uh, she took a short career break to raise a family, but I think immediately started volunteering for community activities, uh, which I always like to see before someone runs for office, uh, that they get a good solid base in the community in which they're located. She actually also worked as a legislative assistant, I think at one time for now Senate Majority Leader, uh, Senator Rosenbaum. But she went on uh, and was and became a state representative and, and then a state senator, and then actually was elected to be a member of Congress. Now, one thing that most of you don't know, or many of you do know, because you're so central to where her district is, or has been, is I think in a period of a relatively short period of time, she faced more elections than most people do in 10 or 15 years. Um, and that is something that I think actually, the more experience you get in elections, the closer that you get to the realities of public life. Uh, she continues. Uh, to be the principal leader that we all know her to be. She can, I was always impressed by her in the Senate because of her work ethic, her tenacity, her endurance, uh, her determination. And she serves on two committees in Congress, and I know this is not particularly a great time to be a Democrat in Congress. But I fully anticipate that she will be very productive even in this difficult time. She works on the Education and Workforce Committee and the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. And for many of us, some of those issues are core to why many of us that are legislative members of why we serve in the Oregon Legislature. Um, finally, I think I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to introduce a former colleague and someone that I know you will all greet with enthusiasm and applause, Congressman Suzanne Bonamici. Thank you so much, Senator Devlin. I think if I move away a little bit, we'll back. Uh, is that good? Yeah. Still hear me? 
Washington County Democrats. Hello, happy spring. I am so thrilled to be here today, and, and I just want to clarify something right away from my introduction. Yes, I am a duck. In fact, I am a double duck because I went to both college and law school at University of Oregon. However, I am bipartisan because I respect the Beavers as well. So just to get that clear. So thank you so much, Washington County Democrats. You uh, helped turn uh, the House blue when I first ran for the state legislature in 2007. When I ran in that race, people said, you know, you'll probably be in the minority, but sure enough, with the help of the Washington County Democrats, we served in the, in the majority in 2007 under the leadership of now Senator Jeff Merkley. And what a great session it was. I see many of my former House colleagues, Chuck Riley, Mitch Greenlee, Tobias Reed. That made a huge difference, uh, what you do here in Washington County. And also, look at 2014. Look what a difference Washington County Democrats made, especially with those House Districts 29 and 30, right? We have Representative Gallegos, Representative McLean, and a strong majority in the Oregon House and Senate, because we have Senator Riley. And the Washington County Democrats are the reason I'm in Congress today. You stepped up, it's a big part of the Congressional District, and helped me through. Thank you, Senator Devlin, for reminding me how many elections I went through. Uh, but thank you so much, and I have to tell you, I'll do a little update from what's happening in Washington, D.C. As you are well aware, majorities matter. They matter a lot. So right before I came back home to Oregon for this uh, two week, I call it an in-district work period, some people call it a recess, in-district work period, the House passed a budget. Now a, a budget is a statement of values and priorities. And what happened with this budget? The majority passed a budget that does, uh, for example, significant cuts to SNAP, food stamps, repeals the Affordable Care Act, privatizes Medicare, block grants Medicaid, cuts Pell Grants, and, this is just a beginning of a list, to make things even worse, when the budget got to the floor, it was amended with a significant increase in defense spending that was not offset. We have a rule in Congress, if you have something that costs, you have to have a way to pay for it. Some tricks were played, they added defense spending to this already, terrible budget that takes our country in the wrong direction. That's what happens with Republican leadership in the U.S. House. And unfortunately, we're expecting similar things in the Senate with their budget process. But I have to tell you, uh, there's some good news as well. We were able to keep the Department of Homeland Security open. Now, I happen to think personally it's a really bad message to send to the world that Congress is so dysfunctional that we can't keep the Department of Homeland Security open, right? And what happened there, as you, you know from watching the press, the uh, bipartisan Department of Homeland Security budget came forward, was amended in the House with these onerous, regressive immigration policies. And the bottom line was, you want to keep the Department of Homeland Security open, you must deport children. Really, that's what it came down to. It was really outrageous. So uh, we were able to, uh, in large part because of the strong leadership of, of uh, leader Nancy Pelosi, who is a phenomenal leader and knows how to get things done, we were able to get that Department of Homeland Security budget passed without that regressive immigration policy. And that was quite an accomplishment to be able to do that. We still have to work on immigration reform, big issue, uh, but we, we were able to, to do what we needed to do to keep the Department of Homeland Security open. Now let me talk a little bit about education. Uh, a strong system of public education is a top priority of mine. I emphasize the public in there. Keeping uh, public education public is a, a big uh, job uh, with the efforts to privatize a lot of education. Uh, I'm working on the Education and Workforce Committee. We've been trying to rewrite the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, also known as No Child Left Behind, right? Now that, that law needs a lot of work, right? One of the most important parts of that law is Title I funding that helps low-income schools. Now, what did the Republicans do? Uh, they changed the funding formula so that the high-need districts will get less 
and districts that are affluent will get a little bit more. Now that is an outrageous thing to do to the uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Now on a positive note, I was able to get an amendment in for fewer, better uh, assessments, less testing, meaningful assessments that help inform instruction. But I have to tell you that that is sitting in the House. We haven't been able to pass it. The Republicans don't think it gets the government out of education enough. And the Democrats won't support it because of what it does to Title I funding. So we're going to keep working on that, uh, working on higher education, which we absolutely need to make more affordable and accessible. Now, you might know that uh, right now in this country, consumer date, debt is more than student loan debt. That is. Uh, a terrible situation for our country to be in. Uh, we've been able to do a little bit with student loan debt, make it more transparent, uh, inform students more about their repayment options and income-based repayment, but we need to do a lot more. Uh, one of the reasons, I, uh, one of the main reasons I voted against the, the Republican budget is because of significant cuts to Pell Grants. That's the wrong direction for our country. Uh, we can't even uh, get the interest rates reduced in student loans. Uh, so we have a lot of challenges. I'm working hard to make sure that we are expressing democratic priorities, working on those things, and getting, getting as far as we can. But we need, need some big changes in 2016. Now, you heard that I also serve on the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. I see climate change and global warming as one of the biggest and most important issues we have to face in this country and in this world. And, and unlike many of my colleagues on the Science Committee, I actually believe that humans contribute to climate change, right? Because that's what the scientists say, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what the overwhelming evidence says. But for some reason, the Science Committee attracts climate change deniers. So we've been able to do some good work improving weather forecasting. Uh, day two of this uh, session of Congress, I was able to pass through the House a bill to improve tsunami warnings and research. I represent the, the north coast of Oregon. That's an important piece of legislation. It's on its way to the Senate. We have it lined up to get through. That's a small piece, but it's not really tackling what we need to do with climate change. Now over on the Senate side, you might, might have seen this. It sounds like an Onion article, but it's true. The chairman of the Senate Committee on the Environment took a snowball to the floor of the United States Senate and said, look, there can't be global warming because it's really cold outside, and threw the snowball in on the floor of the United States Senate. Now, it, that, as I said, is not an Onion article. That really happened. So talk about the challenges. I, I just want you to appreciate what we have in Oregon with Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate, people who are actually believers in human-caused climate change, and making the important uh, policy that we need to move this country forward. So we have a lot of work to do in 2016, and with your help, uh, we're going to not only uh, keep uh, Washington County blue, but help really turn things around across the country by setting such a strong example for uh, how to, to run elections. Uh, I, I want to, before I introduce the Secretary of State, which I'm really honored to do and proud to say Jean Atkins, our Secretary of State, I just want to mention that I uh, had the honor of going to Selma, Alabama this year on the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday with Congressman John Lewis, Congresswoman Terry Sewell. It was an incredibly moving experience to be there and to learn more about the sacrifices that people went through for the right to vote. And you know, I talked to my colleagues from around the country ever since the Supreme Court in 2013 uh, turned back a large part, gutted a large part of the Voting Rights Act. And I look at the states where they're putting up impediments to voting, and I look at Oregon as a shining example of a place we are actually making it easier for people to vote and to register to vote here in the state. And my colleagues look at me and they say, you're doing what? You're making it easier for people to, vo to vote when other states are setting up barriers. So please appreciate, thank you to the legislature, uh, thank you to Governor Kay Brown. Thank you to Secretary of State Gene Atkins for, for doing what you are 
to make it uh, participation in democracy uh, something that is, is easier, and we realize the importance of voting. So it is my great honor to introduce our Secretary of State, Jean Atkins, who comes to the office with a wealth of public servants' ex experience. Secretary Atkins graduated from the University of Oregon School of Law. She spent several years in Washington, D.C., working on primarily women's rights issues, and then returned to Oregon with her husband, John Atkins, who worked for one of my predecessors, Congressman Les Aquine of CD1. Jean headed the Women's and Reproductive Health section of the Department of Human Services in the Office of Family Health. She served in several capacities at Planned Parenthood of the Columbia Willamette. Then she was Senator Merkley's, when he was Speaker of the House, Chief of Staff, and later became Chief of Staff for Senator, now Senator Merkley's successor, then Speaker Dave Hunt. And most recently, she served as uh, Senator Merkley's State Director until January of 2015, when she tried unsuccessfully to retire. <laughs> so, Jean and her husband, John, have one grown son, John, who many of you know because of his involvement in the Washington County Democrats. Uh, I was uh, honored to have John on a couple of my campaign teams and as my legislative assistant in the Oregon legislature when I was in the Senate. Uh, John is now about to graduate from law school in Texas. I know Jean's very proud of him. And very importantly, Jean raised her family and lives in our very own Washington County. So please give Secretary of State Jean Atkins a very warm Washington County Democrat welcome. So much. Um, it has been said a couple different times in a couple different places that I am the first uh, uh, Secretary of State to be from Washington County. I want us to edit that only slightly because um, Secretary of State Phil Kiesling grew up in my neighborhood of Cedar Hills when, uh, and I met his parents and they lived there for a very good long time. However, he wasn't elected Secretary of State when he was living in Washington County, so I can still say I'm the first resident of Washington County to become Secretary of State, but we're going to need to have that clarification. Uh, I'm very glad to have uh, your blessing and his um, uh, as a Washington County resident in this, in this position. And yes, it's a little disorienting for me um, to be elected, uh, introduced by one of my favorite elected officials and to stand before you as a public official on, in my own right. I will tell you, I didn't plan to reinvent myself into this, uh, into this role and seek public office. As a lot of you know, I ran for uh, the state legislature twice in Washington County, uh, back in the day, as we, as we say. Um, lost both times, one by a very narrow margin, um, overcome by absentee ballots back before uh, vote by mail. Um, took three days to lose that one. I took it as a sign that I should find other ways to make the world a better place. Um, and I was lucky to get to do a lot of that at Planned Parenthood, as uh, I had already previous to that been their public affairs director, but uh, served actually as patient services director and oversaw the clinic operations there. Um, at the state of Oregon as manager, uh, manager of Women's and Reproductive Health where we embarked on a whole new expanded family planning Medicaid program negotiated with the federal government. And then yes, back to the state capitol and the U.S. Senate, um, but as a staff director um, and not as an office holder. I did often think to myself, being able to set the agenda for the, for the leadership team uh, has a certain um, clout to it that I acknowledged and probably used on occasion. Um, but I did 
plan to retire after 30 years and uh, 10 wonderful years working mostly in, in those 10 years for Senator Merkley, who I will always admire greatly, um, and who called me uh, the morning I was, uh, it was announced I was appointed, hoping to be the first one to call me Madam Secretary, but I had to tell him my husband had started that the night before, and he was, you know, came in second. Um, so my presence to here today proves that I uh, am an epic failure at retirement. Um, but what you might not know, and I'm happy to share a little bit with you, is how you get from um, uh, a political operative, as I was described in a couple of newspapers, to be Secretary of State. It might be a little cautionary tale for some of you. It might be a celebratory one for others. In February, I heard the news that you all heard that Secretary of State Kate Brown was going to unexpectedly become Governor Kate Brown, and I sent her a text congratulating her, um, like a lot of people, including some of you in this room probably, congratulating her and saying, if there's anything I can do to help in the transition, please let me know. <laughs> A few days later, I got a call from uh, someone in the incoming Governor Brown's transition team who began talking about the task ahead of the governor in determining who would be her replacement. So after a while, I interrupted and said, so are you asking me if I might take charge of vetting those candidates and moving that process along for you? And the answer I got was very surprising. It went something like, well, that would be wonderful if that's what you're willing to do, but the main question is, would you be agree to be on the, uh, be considered yourself for this position? Um, several people here and other places have said they were startled by my appointment, not nearly as startled as I was on the phone at that point. It really was not what I was expecting. Uh, like many women, and this is embarrassing to me because I have been one of those lecturing women about taking charge of their lives and feeling positive about the things that they contribute. Um, it never frankly occurred to me that the service work I had done, as proud of it as I was, would cause someone to think I would be uh, the right person to take over as Secretary of State. So for that, we are ready to do one of those. I'm very proud, and you should be too, I think, that our governor, our new governor, saw me differently than I saw myself. About a week later, I got a call from the governor herself asking me to serve out the rest of her term. And when a governor asks you a question like that, there really is only one answer. So here I am today, a failure at retirement and a feminist parable all by, all by itself. So I'm really glad to be with friends uh, today um, to kind of lose my staff voice and start learning my own voice uh, to speak as, as a public official. Um, but do want to let you know I am very committed to carrying out the duties of Secretary of State to my very best ability. I've worked in the Capitol and in state government for a long time, so I thought I had a pretty good idea about what Secretary of State's office did. Uh, but not surprisingly, like everything else in life, you get there and you find uh, that, you, that there's a lot more to learn. What I'd like to do really quickly is to share with you some of uh, what I have found out in my two and a half weeks I've been, been doing this job. <laughs> Most of you know, of course, that the Secretary of State's office oversees elections in partnership with county elections officers. But my staff of nearly 200 employees does a lot more than that. The Secretary of State's office includes four external divisions, audits, archives, corporation, and elections. Each plays an important public role in our democracy, in our economy, and in our heritage. And each looks for innovative ways to uh, deliver services. A tradition started uh, back with, uh, with uh, Secretary of State Norma Paulus when she first started um, the vote by mail uh, campaign uh, and continuing through Secretary Brown who introduced innovations uh, with, with her team. So take, for instance, archives. Um, Sunday night, the Discovery Channel will uh, have its show that it does on Sunday nights, Who Do You Think You Are? Maybe some of you have seen, seen that. It's the sec it will be the second one that was filmed at the State Archives. Um, it, the uh, guest the first time was Kelsey Grammer. Um, this time it's Tony Goldwyn, and I don't watch Scandal, but I gather he's a, an important <laughs> character on Scandal. Um, it was filmed at our State Archives. That's at least in part because um, 
This was our state archives were the first in the world to have their historical holdings online. And so th that's not something that you do if you're timid. Um, and Oregon has never known for playing it safe in that regard. Secretary of State encouraged a culture of innovation and bold action, and it's something that I am uh, embracing. Another example from the archives, which publishes the Oregon Blue Book, which came out, the first thing I got to do was to celebrate the, the Blue Book that I hadn't done anything for, but uh, Secretary Brown's team had, uh, had, had put out. Uh, and we had to put a little insert in it <laughs> because it was printed, unfortunately, before all of the events that, that brought me to the table. But um, it was a, a, a wonderful opportunity to celebrate uh, something that's very important to, to Oregon. The Blue Book, an almanac of the state of Oregon, has long been filled with beautiful photos. Many of you know there's usually a photo contest for the covers of, of, um, of, the, uh, of the Blue Book. But the photos that are in there cost money to purchase. So several years ago, an archive employee whose job it was to go around Oregon and uh, log the kinds of archives that are held by local governments offered to begin taking photographs that um, during those trips that could be used. Those photographs now you can buy uh, online in the Blue Book um, uh, area. They help fund some of what, uh, what is there. He turned out to be a very wonderful photographer. And it, again, it represents sort of a tradition in the Secretary of State's office that those who work there have ideas to offer. And I don't think as I've gone around, and I've worked in state government, I don't think I've met a team quite so committed to what they do um, as the folks in the Secretary of State's office. The other external divisions are producing great results as well. The corporation division is the home of the Oregon Business Registry. About 65% of Oregon businesses use the online system to, to, do, their, um, to do their registration. Uh, you do that if you want to register a new business name, a limited liability company, a business corporation, or a nonprofit corporation. It used to take about 10 minutes to get through all of what that takes. That wasn't bad, but the agency wanted to make it better. So they consulted customers and did everything you do if you're trying to serve the public well to research. And last fall, they relaunched that website, and now many businesses can be done within a minute of um, signing up. Another addition that happened during uh, Secretary Brown's uh, tenure there is the introduction of a small business advisory um, group that uh, is one and a half staff at this point, um, but which troubleshoots for small businesses that are having trouble with red tape in other state agencies. And documenting sort of what the various problems are, working with the agencies to resolve them, much like the kind of casework I was just doing alongside of uh, my colleagues in the Senate office. Uh, a very, very uh, important program to, to be added. So Corporation Division helps the economy, Archives preserves our state heritage. The Audits Division provides a roadmap for state agencies to find their way to peak performance. The job of our Audits Division is to offer state agencies concrete recommendations on how to deliver services more effectively and more efficiently. Last week, we released an audit um, that took a hard look at how state government implements IT projects. I don't have to tell you that major IT projects are a problem. Um, but the review of all different audits that have happened over different projects over time identified that the two most important uh, challenges that we face are the lack of experience by managers within agencies in terms of handling or knowing um, the ins and outs of IT projects. And also that while the state has put in recent years some systems for accountability along the way, the legislature has been working on this for some time, that those are still falling a bit short and need more attention and more, um, more investment to, to, be, to work. The final external division I oversee is elections. And obviously you know that Oregon has been a long national leader here. We pioneered vote by mail. We were an early adopter of online voter registration, and now we're going to blaze a new trail with the new Motor Voter Act. You all have probably followed this, so I don't need to go into great detail about it, but you know, here's how it works now. Oregon requires that you provide proof of age, residency, and legal status in order to obtain a driver's license. 
You take a number, you wait and provide that paperwork, you get your picture taken, and you get a valid driver's license. Then you're asked if you want to fill out more paperwork in order to become registered to vote. You've already established by what you've provided already that you are eligible to vote, but you have to stick around the MVV, do an additional form. New Motor Voter eliminates that last step. Instead of requiring you to fill out what really is redundant paperwork, you don't have to do anything more in order to be registered to vote. DMV will notify the Secretary of State that you've established your voter eligibility, will notify you uh, by mail that you don't have to do anything more to be registered, but give you the opportunity to declare affiliation with a party if you choose to do so, or to declare that you want to opt out. Want nothing to do with your voter registration. Initially, we anticipate registering 300,000 eligible voters, uh, reaching back to the beginning of 2013, getting data from the Department of Motor Vehicles. Eventually, we expect to add most of the estimated 800,000 eligible but currently unregistered Oregonians to the voter rolls. And that would be worth doing if that's all if the, that the New Motor Voter Act accomplishes but it really does have the potential to do more. Right now, there are dozens of organizations, including Washington County Democrats, who collectively spend tens of thousands of dollars and hundreds of volunteer hours trying to register Oregonians and keep them from missing that 21-day cutoff uh, for, for registration. By changing from an opt-in system to an opt-out system, New Motor Voter will eventually allow those organizations to focus their registration activities on the truly hard to reach individuals, those who don't connect with the Department of Motor Vehicles, and then reallocate their valuable resources to educate voters and encourage them to vote. Not only do we remove a significant barrier to registration with New Motor Voter, we open up the possibility of new ways to talk to voters and have a better informed electorate. And it also represents, as, as Representative Bonamici said, a very important civic principle. It set up, sets a presumption that all who are eligible to vote here can and should do so, not a presumption that voting isn't important. That's something I'm obviously very proud to be part of. Implementing new motor voter effectively in the next year is top of the list of the jobs um, that I have to do with the team. I feel very privileged to complete that job that she started. So that's the Secretary of State's office, archives, audits, elections, corporation. I will lead them as best I'm able for the next 21 months. I'll encourage them to continue doing the innovative work that they are so good at. And then I will retire again. <laughs> and next time, no more sending congratulatory texts. This time I really mean it. So thank you for the opportunity to spend some of the time with you all today and have a wonderful uh, Easter and Passover and spring. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary of State Atkins. I am now going to turn over the next portion of the agenda because I actually want to move away from the podium for this portion of the agenda. If um, Chair Colquitt would come forward and identify who's going to actually run this uh, event. <laughs> and uh, this is the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this is the uh, heads and tails. <laughs> 